This message, Forgiveness, Side A, is part of the Get Your Love On sermon series shared by Pastor Alan Galloway at First Christian Church of Napa on April 28, 2024. So uh, I have an issue. Uh, this is, I'm going to need your counsel. Uh, this is called Counsel the Pastor, and uh, I'm going to present a problem that I have, and I'm going to need your counsel on uh, what I should do. So I've got a good friend, a uh, pretty good friend. We've known each other for quite a while, and uh, really lacks self-awareness. Um, you know, talk to them about certain things and what's going on and just doesn't always pick up on it. And recently has done some things that's just very, very offensive. Um, really has caused me some wounds in my heart. And I know what I'm feeling, but I'm really like, okay, what do I do? How do I respond to this situation. In fact, this sounds a little bit like a podcast, right? Called Counsel the Pastor. Maybe we should start something like this each week. I invite one of you to come in and sit and I present a problem that I'm having and you just kind of give me some good counsel. What do I do in this situation? What, what should we do? What would I get counsel from you to do? I'll wait because I got time. <laughs> well, here's what I would say. Let's pray. Father in heaven, how great and marvelous and wonderful you are. You are the Lord of lords because you are the king of all kings. And we are just so grateful that you know us by name. You know each one of our situations. You know the challenges that we face. You know the dynamics of the relationships that we're in. You know the heartache and the hurt, and the wound of every one of us here in this moment as you do with each person around this planet. We're just in awe of how magnificent and wonderful you are. Today we want to be in the school of the Spirit ministered to so that we might minister to others. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your life that you willingly gave. As we've just celebrated at the table of remembrance, God, that forgiveness was very costly. And Lord, we we recognize that and the holiness of it. And so, Father, we want to receive all that you would have for each of us today in the wonderful, powerful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hey, if you have a Bible, we're going to look at a great passage in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew 18. In fact, we're continuing a series called Get Your Love On or maybe Keep Your Love On. And the theme today is this idea of forgiveness uh, because it's central. It's at the heart of the disciple's life. Um, and that's what I was kind of illustrating is how do I forgive this person who's been super offensive to me? And at times, I'm going to be honest, it is hard to forgive at times. Right? So I want you to do that right now. I want you to get somebody in your mind that you think you should forgive. I'll wait. Okay, everybody's got one, right? Everybody's got somebody that I need to forgive. I want you to kind of keep that person kind of at the front of your thinking today and as you're processing through what Jesus teaches. In fact, Jesus teaches in his model prayer, sometimes called the Lord's Prayer, uh, the Disciples' Prayer. He reveals really how daily this need is to forgive, almost like it's daily bread. Uh, We need bread daily to sustain us. We need forgiveness to sustain us. We don't have to look too far. We can see it in our homes, in our work environments. We see it in schools. We see it with best friends, right? There's been these issues that have caused a division in someone, in a relationship. Sometimes it's deep hurt or betrayal. And at times, it's really hard to forgive others. Sometimes it's hard to forgive ourselves. Can anyone relate? Yeah, it is hard. That's why I love when the Hebrew writer talks about Jesus being able to empathize with us in every one of our issues, our weaknesses, I think about this particular part of his ability to connect with us when I think about his relationships with his disciples, specifically Judas. He knows betrayal. In fact, Matthew 18, we have it on the screen here. Matthew 18, verse 21, Jesus has been teaching. And Peter, about forgiveness and this theme, and Peter comes to him and asks this great question. Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? 
right? Like seven times? Why seven times, right? He was kind of like, get, you know, really placing it high, like seven times? Is that, is that good? Am I ahead of the curve? Well, the issue of the day was that the rabbis debated this very issue, this question, how many times in a given day should you forgive someone? And they came to the conclusion that if I forgive them three times in that day, the fourth time, I can be done with them. Some of us are like, amen, uh-huh, yeah, right? Like Peter, I think it's easy for us to think of ourselves kind of in his shoes like, hey, I'm doubling it, and I'm just going to have one cherry on the top. Am I above the curve? And Jesus would say, hey, you're kind of missing the point here. Mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, let me ask you, have you ever had to force kids, grandkids to forgive one another? Yes, kind of force them into that. It's like, you know, Billy, I want you to forgive Sally. I forgive you. Right? It's like, well, your face is not saying it. I hear the words, but, you know, is there something else going on here? We kind of want to get past it as fast as we can. I think that's what a child does. Hey, we are no different as adults. Here's some things that you might sound familiar to you. You've heard once or twice before. Hey, I said I was sorry. Just get over it. <laughs> this is, we'll have confession at the end of the service, but anybody? Here's one. I'm commanded to love you, but I just don't have to like you. Is that forgiveness? Right? Hey, Pastor Allen, I really, I have forgiven that person. I just cannot stand to be in the same room with them. Ooh, wow, 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 wow. So here's a popular idea that forgiveness can be given, biblical forgiveness can be had without reconciliation. That's just not what the Bible says. Right? This is what Matthew 18 is revealing. Peter's question is a great question. I think maybe I, I've asked it many times. Maybe you've asked it. You know, how much is enough? I mean, is there a, a quota? Is there a way that I can sign and say, okay, I'm done. I'm done. I've done it. When is the line of forgiveness kind of uh, able to kind of put a stop on it and I can move on? Well, Jesus answers it in verse 22. Jesus answered how? I tell you, not seven times, but 70 Seven times. Now, some of your translations may set, say seven times 70. So whether it's 77 times or 490 times, the point of what Jesus is saying, listen, forgiveness is beyond a simple exchange of words. No, forgiveness comes from where? Deep within the heart. Deep within this deep res- uh, reservoir of who we are and what we're about. It's a deep Mark of maturity. That's why this series says one of the greatest marks of our maturity is how well we love others. This is what I was talking about last week, right? The simple, uh, naive person or the foolish person or even that evil person, right? How do I express love to him? Well, Jesus continues on in the story of Matthew 18, and you may want to make some notes for yourself to look at this week, but let me just read the story quickly. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who went to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold, anybody like, man, I wish I had 10,000 bags of gold, especially at the prices that they're going today, was brought to him, and since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. What's the point? The point is that Jesus is saying, listen, there's this guy. He owed an infinite amount that could never be repaid. I mean, it is so enormous, impossible. In fact, this is what Paul Paul the Apostle is getting to in Romans chapter 3, right? Just one sin, one little tiny sin, it takes an eternity to repay it. It is impossible to repay it out of our own ability. Now, I think most of you know my son started college as a math major. He switched into accounting. And uh, so it's fun having a math major around. Uh, You got a billion or excuse me, a million, and then a billion, and then a trillion. What comes next? Quadrillion. Quadrillion. Then what? Quintillion. Quintillion. Keep going. Don't know. <laughs> oh, somebody said it. Sextillion, right? Sounds like a reptile. Septillion. Octillion. Eventually you get to what? What's the final number? A Google, Googleplex. Google, go ahead and say it. Googleplex, right? Googleplex. It's like. In other words, Jesus is saying, hey, your debt is like a Googleplex. It's like to the 10th power. There's like, there's just no way. And how do we respond? Hey, be patient with me. I will pay every part of it. Just give me a chance. Just give me a chance. We call that delusion, right? There's just, there's just no way. It's impossible. You can't do it. 
I'll pay it back. The gospel is clear. It's impossible. In fact, look what the servant says. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant, his master, took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. I mean, the gospel is like impossible, and it's beautiful at the same time. And this is where we say the gospel is good news. Just say good news. It's good news. This is a picture of Jesus saying, I'm taking... Uh, your debt and paying it off, right? Jesus' account, it's an accounting term. Uh, I'm taking the accounts that you owe, this amount that you can't repay, I'm taking that. I've got every resource beyond this that heaven's here, and I'm going to apply them to your account. Your account that's in the negative big time is now in the positive because my account is credited to your account, and everybody said amen. 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 That's such a good thing, such a good thing. Well, the story goes on, verse 28 and 29, neighbor who owed a little comes to this guy who's owed a lot and had the debt forgiven, and he begins demanding, give it to me now. I want you to pay back what you owe me. And he starts, in fact, choking the guy. By the way, do Christians ever do this? If you're wondering, yeah, all the time, right? Verse 32, the master heard about what the servant was doing, and he said, what? You wicked. Last week, if you're with us, you evil servant. He said, I cancel all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. I wish I could spend some time here, but the implication is that we see this picture in the natural of being jailed because of the debt you could never pay. You're going to prison forever. But it's not just a natural, it's a spiritual There's a component of this that, man, the demonic has a way of influence when you hold on to unforgiveness. Oh, I wish I could hang out there. I got to keep going. Verse 35 is where I want us to really focus today. Verse 35, let's actually just say it together on the screen. Say it with me. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from, say it again, from where? 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 From your heart. Forgiveness is at the core. It's at the very heart of what it means to follow Jesus, to be a disciple. And yet I have found in my own life, in the years that I've been in ministry, that most Christians don't fully understand biblical forgiveness. In fact, I've observed that most Christians will go about maybe halfway through the process. That forgiveness is a process. It's a journey. It's a pathway. And I'll be very frank with you. I have studied this passage, read this passage, taught on this passage. This week, I was super humbled. When I said week one, I was silenced by the word. Yeah, it was this week. I was silenced as I just dug into this theme and this idea that um, maybe I really am not all that attuned to what biblical forgiveness really is. Let me link it to last week. When I said it's complex to love, to show love, demonstrate love to someone who's naive or very simple uh, or that person who's very foolish or even that person who's evil, that there is a, there's degrees of it. There's an understanding and a wisdom that it takes to do that. It is true also with this issue of forgiveness. It's very similar. There takes great wisdom in, in a working of God in our lives because what I think, as most don't understand it, we also apply these popular misunderstandings. This is one of them, is that forgiveness is just simply a one-time event. And I thought back through my notes going, yeah, I think I've said that before, right? It's a one-time event, and we immediately think of Paul on the road to Damascus. Are you familiar with that story? Apostle Paul, who was very anti-Christ and Christians, and he was, in fact, wanting to capture them, put them in prison, have them killed. What does he do? He's on his road to do that very thing, and he meets Jesus in a radical, radical way, transformation. He's forgiven, and now he's fully mature, we think. He's gentle and kind and patient, and we don't realize that, you know, he's been like three years in isolation, uh, learning from the Spirit of the Lord, and then 11 years before he even ventures out into ministry. And what we know of Paul, we think it's just like that. It's this one-time event. The truth is, is that forgiveness, it may take some time. In fact, it may get deeper over time within you. Have you forgiven that person? Yeah, I've forgiven them. Why are you asking me? (laughs) I know exactly where you're at. I'm with you. I'm with you. So it's popular to think that way. It's one time. It's also popular to think that 
Forgiveness from a biblical perspective is simply forgive and forget. Anybody ever do that? Forgive, forget, just go with it, right? Not you, you liar. Uh, Hey, it's over. It never happened. As our brothers and sisters in the East would say, forget about it, right? (laughs) This has never happened. It's just, you know, just sweep it under. Heard of a couple, older couple, who's taken their life savings and invested it with this faith organization that uh, had some really unbelievable um, investment opportunities. And as all investment opportunities have a measure of risk to it, they lost it all, all of it, destitute, heartbroken and angry and confused. How could this happen? They went to the pastor of the church they were attending. The pastor's counsel was simply this. Listen, it happened. Get over it. Move forward in your life. Serve God. That's not really biblical forgiveness. As easy as that is to say. There are three core components to forgiveness that we're going to unpack. I'm only going to look at the first one today. This is so complex. It's so immense. The second two I'm going to talk about next week. But think of these as like ingredients to this process of forgiveness. The first is a hunger for restoration. Then, that's what I'm going to talk about today. And then it's revoking the right to revenge. Anybody like me? I like revenge. I'm just being honest. I do. I do. And then third, offer good, expressing itself in love. It's very straightforward. A hunger, a revoking, and then an offering good. It requires of us this deep, what I would say a deep soul work. And that deep soul work is super painful. It's painful. See, the Pharisees of Jesus' day, they had made a religious checkbox system of this issue of forgiveness, right? Forgive three times, and then if it happens a fourth time, then just be done with them. Move on, right? You're dead to me. That might be a little bit of a clue for us in our own lives that we are offer, uh, or we're quick to offer fixes because the pain is so real and so deep to truly forgive from the heart. So before I jump into this idea of, again, a hunger for, for restoration, let me just give us a definition. And I'm going to refer to this again next week. And so you may want to write this down. If you're taking notes, write it down. If you're not taking notes, write it down, right? To cancel debt that is fully owed. This is again, to cancel debt that's fully owed. So it's fully owed, that debt. And offer forgiveness through repentance with the intention of reconciliation. To cancel the debt that is fully owed and to offer forgiveness through repentance with the intention of reconciliation. That's this three-part ingredient to biblical forgiveness. So I want to just look at the hunger for restoration today. A hunger for it. What does that look like? If you're in Matthew, flip over to the Gospel of Luke. Luke 17. Luke 17, Jesus again is teaching his disciples and helping them to understand this idea of faith and sin and how we live out this transformed kingdom life. And so he's telling them, hey, watch yourself. Like, I love what David said in the devotion, uh, uh, offering devotion, right? Is don't worry about the other person. Focus about yourself right now, where you are, right? You take a look at the plank in your eye first, right? Watch yourself. If your brother or sister, verse 3, right, sins against you, what do you do? Okay, open book test. It's on the screen. (laughs) Rebuke them. If your brother or sister sins against you, do what? Rebuke them, right? And if they do what? Repent. Then what? Forgive them. Let me say that again, because I'm not sure we're really connecting some of the dots here. If your brother or sister sins against you, so there's a wrong that's being committed, right? It, it, it's true. There's a debt that's owed. You do what? You confront them. How many of you just love confrontation? Show of hands. Right? Uh, yeah, one, two, three. I knew it would be those three. Because I get it every Sunday afternoon from them. Um, love, I'm kidding. I'm kidding, 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 kidding. Bad pastor, bad pastor, <clears throat> right? <clears throat> there's a rebuke, there's a confrontation, and then there what? there's a repent, there's a changing of thinking, and then there's a forgiveness. It's very basic. In fact, verse 4 is beautiful because 
it's this idea of, again, how many times? Seven times, seven times in a day, seven times you go back. Again, it's not the count, the number, it's the heart. The implication here is that if a person is not repentant, how can you forgive them? There's like a short circuit in what's going on in the relationship. Let me take this a little deeper for us. Back to again the communion, again, through the lens of Jesus Christ on the cross. What did Jesus say? Father, forgive them for they what? They know not what they do. Okay, question. You've got that picture. You know that verse. At that moment, that moment in time, were they forgiven? Right? The soldiers nailing Jesus' hands and feet. Soldier sticking a spear into his side. The religious leaders who conspired to bring this about. Pilate who oversees the governments of execution. The crowd chanting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Were they forgiven in that moment? Let me ask a second question as you're kind of pondering that. Did they receive forgiveness and then become followers of Jesus in that moment? Now that might be a little bit easier question to answer. No, they didn't. Forgiveness was offered to them. In fact, the cross is very much an open door for relationship, a relationship back to God. But they needed to receive that. In fact, that was one of the thieves on the cross hung between Jesus, right? He recognizes his predicament. He recognizes and he's repentant in that moment and he receives a forgiveness and the opportunity to be with God in paradise. But the other one, what? Not so much. Here's the point, right? Forgiveness is offered, and it requires another party, the other person, to repent in order to close that circuit, to close that circle, to be complete. That's biblical forgiveness, which I think, again, is often misunderstood in the church. Let me illustrate it like this. Dan, <laughs> poor Dan, he sits on the front row. It's like everybody's like, don't sit on the front row, Dan. Dan, I sin against you again this week and today, and, um, and you offer me forgiveness because you're a great guy. You offer me forgiveness and do that. But it's not a complete biblical forgiveness without me acknowledging the wrong that I've done to you. You tracking with me? Everybody's with me still? This is what it means to hunger for a reconciliation. I desire it. I want it. I long for it. You're in Luke 17. Flip to Luke 15. Luke 15. The story of the prodigal son. Really, even if you don't have a lot of, you know, Bible background, many of us know this story because it's very popular in our culture. The story of the prodigal. We see it played out in books and movies and all kinds of ways, right? Jesus is telling this powerful picture and this model for us of what it looks like in a daily life. So the story of the prodigal son is, right, two brothers, a younger and an older, and their father. And the younger comes to the father and demands his inheritance now before the father has died. Very offensive in that culture in that day. But the father gives him the inheritance, and he wants to go off and do his thing. And so he goes off, and he does his thing. And pretty soon, he's out of his thing, right? He's, he finds himself sitting with pigs and wanting to eat what pigs eat. Now, anybody ever been around pigs? And feeding pigs? Okay, a few of you. Have you desired to eat what they eat? It's made me want to at least think a little bit about not eating bacon, but it didn't last very long. But <laughs> it's gross. I mean, it's like, ooh. Um, he, verse 17, comes to an awareness of his condition. He, I came to my senses. Verse 20, he begins to take those first steps towards repentance. He recognizes, I have wronged. I've done wrong. And he gets up and he begins to move. And in that moment, verse 20, we see the father moving forward with forgiveness. Now, the father, please hear me. The father's not saying, hey, listen, forget about it. It didn't happen. Never happened. I don't ever talk about it again. The father's not saying that. That's not the text. That's not what is being revealed through Jesus. But it's what it's showing is the father's hunger, this deep hunger in him for his son to return, to come to a place of repentance, to change his thinking about his life and what is right and what is good. Uh, he wants the son to come home. And so when that day finally comes, he sees him, he's overcome because it's so deep within his core that he runs. He runs and he hugs him. He throws his arms around him. He kisses him. Something very undignified. 
for a man in his position, but he's just so overcome. In verse 21, we see repentance. Verses 22, 23, 24, we see biblical restoration. A party. Let's celebrate. See, here's the thing. If I am to forgive, it must begin, like the Father demonstrates, with a hunger to forgive. I have to have this hunger, this appetite within me, stir me. And if I'm honest, I don't always want to do that. I don't want to always celebrate. In fact, I'd rather sometimes be the older son. To fall back into my religious activity. I'm a good person. I'm a good person. I do good things. Here's the point, application to one. We offer forgiveness, another person repents. Repentance that leads to the restoration, right? We, that's how you close this circuit, the circle. In other words, it begins with this deep desire to welcome intimacy, to welcome the relationship. If I'm hungering for it, there's probably a part of me that has a weeping moment. Sometimes in the heavy, uh, dark hours of the night or a heavy heart throughout my day is that the relationship is not right. We're not in this intimate communion with one another as I desire. And that's what the Father is demonstrating, this hunger for it, a desire for it, to see his son. And when he does see his son coming, I think as any father could see a child this is broken and crushed by the events of doing things your own way. And coming home into that place. I mean, so I sometimes hardships can be such a powerful teacher for us. And so it leads him to this place, and his heart is just, oh, it's just compassion filled for the son. Now, I want to pause here because I had to pause here as I was putting my notes together and thinking about my own life. This is why forgiveness is truly a a mark of our maturity, a mark of how we love others because it has this ability to bring up these deep, strong emotions, things that you thought you had dealt with years ago, things that you thought, where did that come from, that are just so resonating in you and vibrating within you. And yes, there are times that restoration is impossible this side of heaven. Yes, that is true. But there is a greater hunger in us for reconciliation, for restoration. See, it's easy to kind of fall again to those popular misunderstandings. And when we do that, I think we become very robotic. You know what I mean by that, right? Robotic, right? I forgive you, right? Very cold and sterile, very robotic. I say the words, but like there's no love in those words. And I often, if I continue to move in that direction in a very robotic way and just saying the words, going through the motions, then I can easily become very pharisaical. I did what was right. I did what the law required of me, but my heart was far from the confession. Here's another truth. It is costly to forgive. It is costly to forgive because what that means it means I have to cancel the debt that's owed me. What are some of the debts that are owed you? See, again, I like revenge. I would rather send you to collections, get paid back with interest, and then never have to deal with you and see your face again. Oh, this is getting real, right? I might be the only one who's felt like that because it's, it's costly. It's also costly to repent, to be on the other side of it because it means I've got to come clean. I've got to own my issue. I own my part in the relationship break. I own the sin that I have committed against you. See, it's always these two parties, right, that must move towards reconciliation for reconciliation to be possible. Both parties coming to the table together. And that's why I love in Luke 15, this picture that God offers forgiveness to the entire planet. Just offers it, opens it up. It's through Jesus Christ, the door, right? His death, his burial, his resurrection. But every person on planet Earth must do what? They must choose. 
They must choose to repent and then receive the restoration, the reconciliation. Some, honest, right, will, might forgive because we just don't want to deal with the tormentors. So we kind of forgive out of fear. But that's not what really lasting. That's not true forgiveness. That's older brother forgiveness. Think about this, right? The employee who loses their job just a few months before retirement. They've worked there their whole lives. And then just like that, it's not because the company, you know, was in financial hardship, but just boom like that. And their response is, oh, it's no big deal. So I'll bounce back. I'll get another job. I'll, I'll do something before, uh, before I need to. <laughs> no big deal. It didn't happen. Or how about the wife who says to her husband after a deep, heartbreaking betrayal, I forgive you, but I will never speak to you again. Right? Right? And now, please hear me. I'm not saying that in that situation that someone ought to remarry. Please, that's not what I'm saying at all. Like I said last week, there are levels of betrayal and abuses and evil that take place. What I'm talking about is this deep, deep forgiveness from the heart that Jesus models for us. Not to be a doormat, but to be a willing participant to forgive. I'm gonna talk more about this next week. How about this is, and this is, a, this is a hard one. This is a pit of evil one. Child ritual abuse, right? It's often to see adults who have experienced that to say, I will never, never forgive that parent and what they did, what they allowed to happen to me. Heard of a story of someone who was in therapy and moving through the process of just restoring and counselor asked a very profound question. So what if there was a but, two buttons before you? Button number one said that if you push that, there would be immediate annihilation of that parent, just like that, instantaneous. Button number two, if you pressed it, they would come to this deep, radical repentance, so transformative that they would become the parent that God intended them to be in the first place. Long pause in, in that counseling office to venture the patient said, well, I can't choose. I can't choose. It's impossible. If I push number one, I just prove that I'm as evil as they are. But if I press number two, I admit that I want them to be that parent that they should have been to me in the first place, which is even more painful. In other words, I just do want to show and give them any satisfaction that they have hurt me. Please, please hear my heart. God desires reconciliation uh, to stir up this hunger within us, to awaken us to the paths of restoration. It does not mean that child must move back in with that parent. That's not what that, that means. To say it never happened, right? Clean slate, just start over. That's not what that means. And yet, God wants us to be stirred with this deep hunger that he himself shows for us to forgive those who hurt us. And I can hear it from you right now. It is impossible. Pastor, that is impossible. There's no way I can do that. Amen. Amen. It is, it's impossible. I don't presuppose that I know all the mysteries of God, the complexities of relationships. But I do know that as I look at Luke 15 and I feel conviction in my own heart that it's impossible for me to truly forgive without a burden for the offender to be reconciled to God, to come into that place where they, just, they, they meet God in a true and deep way and that there can be reconciliation between us. And you can't make yourself feel this. I've tried. It doesn't work. I mean, I'd rather push button one, button one, button one. It's deep. It's deep hurt, deep pain, and it takes deep maturity and courage to step in 
to that. It's an invitation that you hold in this holiness, a holy tension, that I'm hungering for that offender to live in the fullness of God's grace, to feel the brokenness, deep brokenness of their sin, to come to this place of true repentance and deep transformation, and at the same time, hold the desire for vengeance now. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, but Jesus, could you bring it today? I mean, that's what I want. Could you bring it now? And to be in that, that place. For me, if I long for the father who hurt me, it means I must admit the deep sadness and loss and pain of what has happened to me. I would rather not think about it because it is super painful. It's what Proverbs 13, 12 tells us. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. That heart sick idea is just that you have this constant nauseation. You're just nauseated. What's going on? What's happened? And it's like, I don't want this. I don't want to feel like this. And so I do everything I can to avoid it, to bury it, to deaden it, to numb it. And the truth is, it's impacting every part of my life. It's because I push it down. If you push it down, you push hope down. Because with God, all things are possible. And if I push it down, then my heart becomes cold. It becomes deadened to the things of God, to the ways of God, to what God is doing in my own heart and life and mind. And that's why it's easy to write off offenders. The person who's hurt you, it's easy. Cut them off. It's easy. It's common. Why we hunger for this way of God to reconcile all things. It admits that I long for Jesus to make all things new, to restore all things, where the lion and the lamb lay down together, where there's no more sorrow, sadness, there's no more sin. Perfect relationship. Luke 15, that there is celebration every day, a party every day. Last week, again, I talked about the naive and the fool and the evil person. And Paul would tell us like, each, each type of person and everybody in between. Romans 12, 18, if it's possible, if it's possible, do everything within your power. Possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. That's his command. This is the direction. This is the godly counsel of the apostle Paul. But let's not be naive and think that Paul is saying that this is not a real tension that we live within. All right, let's not be naive, right? All, not all relations are rec- relationships are reconciled this side of heaven. That's why Romans 8 says that we're groaning for things to be restored, that God would make all things new. So let's not be naive. Let's not also be foolish and to think that, you know what? I can change that person. I can change them. I, I could do that. Only God changes a heart. Our attempts to pressure somebody with, quote, good may produce some external change, but it won't bring that deep, lasting, transformational, Holy Spirit-infused change. That's why Luke 15 is so humbling. That's why I say I am humbled by the word because of what it means. I thought maybe I was a pretty good forgiver, but I'm starting to wonder, maybe I'm not as good as I think I am. But I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that I don't have to stand before God and prove how good I am. Amen? Because who do we stand before God in? Jesus. In Jesus. With Jesus. His account for me. To cancel a debt that is fully owed. And to offer forgiveness through repentance. With the intention of reconciliation. This is the greatest mark of maturity for a Christ follower. And I want to give you an opportunity in these closing minutes that we have together just to move into a a place, that next step for you, what what God might be stirring in you. And so I just want to invite you to stand. And maybe you do. Back to what I asked you. Maybe you were honest and said, this is the person in my life that um, I do need to forgive. I need to release. But, Pastor, it is hard. It is. It is impossible without the work of the Spirit of God moving in your heart and your mind. 
King David was a man after God's own heart, but he had some grievous actions and sins in his life. And as a result of that most grievous of sins, he penned Psalms 51. And I want to use this as a prayer prompt for us today. If your heart is heavy because there is a relationship that's just, it's not restored, it's not reconciled. I want to give you an opportunity to let the Holy Spirit work in you, and then you let him work in them today. And just using David's psalm as a prayer prompt. And so I will invite you to close your eyes. If you want to open your hands up before the Lord, I just give you permission to do that as a way of just saying, Lord, here I am. Here I am. All of me. Yes. Mm. Psalms 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love according to your great compassion. Just let Holy Spirit stir in you right now. Speak to you. Reveal to you. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. So Holy Spirit is stirring amongst you. And in you, let him bring to the surface those things of confession, those things to let go of, those things to admit, Lord, this was wrong on my part. And now, Holy Spirit, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Receive the complete work of Jesus. As we celebrated at communion, as we celebrated today in song, as we've celebrated, let his, his overpowering grace cover you, washing you, renewing you. And now I just invite you to take whatever step Holy Spirit is showing you to move towards that repentance, that change of thinking. Psalms 51, 11, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Make that your prayer. A willingness, an openness to Jesus and his work, his healing touch. As the hymn says, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left me a crimson stain. He washed me white as snow. So now just receive what Holy Spirit is doing in this moment for you and renewing you and restoring you, refreshing you, and infusing you for some action steps, the marks of repentance, that I'm changing my direction, I'm changing my thinking. And Holy Spirit, we just thank you. We pray as we can't do it in our own strength, but through the power of Christ at work within us, we receive what you would have. Every assignment that you have for us this day, uh, for this week, this month, Lord, we want to just receive that with a yes, with an amen. So now in the name of Jesus, we receive, we receive full forgiveness. We receive empowerment to walk in the newness of life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again for joining us for today's message from First Christian Church. If you'd like to take a step in your faith and connect with a staff member at FCC, visit fccnapa.org slash connect. To stay up to date on things going on in the FCC community, we invite you to follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to the FCC Napa YouTube channel. Have a great day.